Everybody, um, since we don't have a whole lot of time in class to do demos, I thought I would do one for you here in our Gen Chem lab. Okay, so um, transition metals are strange, and we're going to learn a little bit of why they're strange and also really, really useful. So just to kind of backtrack from uh, last semester, when we talked about dissolving something in water, something simple like sodium chloride, we might write this equation. So it's uh, dissolving into a cation and an anion. Oh, by the way, Dr. Kegeris is videoing this, so he'll correct me if I make a mistake, which is fine, okay? So, uh, and then we write these subscripts AQ, AQ for aqueous, and you might remember that more realistically what's happening is water is polar, it has a partial negative part to it and a partial positive part to it, partial positive on hydrogen, partial negative on oxygen, and we'll have to review all of that. And what you get there is an ion dipole interaction between the cation and then the anion with the other side of the water. And that's fine, and we call those solvated ions. Now these are not transition metals. Transition metals though behave a little differently when they dissolve in water or when something happens. So I'm not gonna explain all of this, I just wanna show you some demos. So what I've got over here is something we used a lot last semester, and it's copper sulfate pentahydrate, and it's blue. Okay, so what I did was I took some of this copper sulfate pentahydrate and I heated it on a hot plate and lo and behold, it gets less blue. <laughs> it actually, I didn't do this entirely. There's still some blue there, but it's kind of white and gray. I'm gonna put some of this on a uh, watch glass. And then what I'm gonna do is uh, add some water to it. So this is just deionized water in these two beakers. And look what happens. I don't know if you can catch it on the video. Actually, a little steam is given off because this is an exothermic reaction. It was endothermic to drive the water away because I had to heat it. So the reverse should be exothermic. And if I think, yep, it's actually a little bit warm underneath the watch glass there. So the thing is when you put the water in there, it makes it blue. Okay, so I'm gonna do this on a slightly larger scale over here. So this is just a beaker of water, stir bar, because I'm lazy, and I'm gonna take a bunch of this copper sulfate that's been dehydrated, remember? And I'm gonna put it into the beaker of stirring with water. And it doesn't stay this color anymore. It goes back to being blue. Now that's kind of interesting. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about what's going on there, okay? Um, something else I wanna show you is another example of this, is something we used last semester, is copper chloride hexahydrate. And we used this last semester too, I think. Cobalt. Uh, oh, excuse me, cobalt, thank you, copper. Cobalt, and it's actually cobalt two chloride hexahydrate because it's a plus two ion. And we're gonna use this again uh, this semester, I believe, in a synthesis reaction, so we'll, we'll find that out. So it's purple. Now, I didn't dehydrate this one like I did before because we have a jar of it. And this is uh, anhydrous cobalt chloride. You can already see, it's blue when it doesn't have the water. It's purple when it has the water. So what we should see is, I'm gonna take some of this out and put it on a watch glass so you can kind of see it. And I don't know if you can kind of look at the jar carefully. There actually is some purple reddish around because it's absorbing water from the air. So I have to keep this thing capped as best I can. All right, and I'm gonna do the same thing here now. So when the water is gone, it's blue. When I put, whoa. When I put the water back in the form of just a beaker of deionized water, what do you think is going to happen when I put blue powder into water? Well, it turns red, okay? So the point here is this. I'm not going to do pictures for all of these things. Is something different happens when we have cobalt plus two and copper plus two interacting with water, it's not exactly the same as just being surrounded by water like being solvated. There's something else going on. When water approaches a transition metal cation, and that's only one of them actually, in both these cases there's going to be six waters that approach it. You might remember when there's a central atom with six things, that's called an octahedral geometry, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So 
something happens, the color changes, it can't be explained the exact same way as a non-transition metal ion. The other thing I want to show you here is the demo is what happens if we put something other than water in there? Is water the only thing that will essentially grab onto the transition metal? Well, no. And I'm going to show you something here. This is concentrated ammonia. Okay. So I'm going to take some concentrated ammonia and add it to this. And there's competition now. We have NH3, that's ammonia, and H2O, both of which will grab onto the transition metal and they compete. So if you look at this carefully, wow, it turns really dark blue, but then it goes back. But if I keep adding a perfect stoichiometric amount, which is of course exactly what I'm doing, we get a different color. It's the ammonia now that is surrounding, whoops, excuse me. It's ammonia that is now surrounding and grabbing onto the copper ion, and it's a different color. Maybe that isn't obvious by looking there, okay? But it becomes a different color. So what grabs onto the transition metal cation matters, and that's called a ligand. So what we're going to learn about is the different chemistry between a transition metal cation and the different kinds of ligands that can grab onto it and what kind of properties do they have. And we'll talk about that in class. Thank you.